Good morning, brethren. I want to welcome you back to our School of the Word. I believe that you've been um, taking time to listen, to study together with us, and I believe that you've been blessed. Tonight, today we'll continue with the School of the Word, and we'll continue with um, what we have been covering the last number of weeks. Let me just do a brief overview. We said that to have an illuminating understanding and the study of the Old Testament, we need to understand the world of the Old Testament. We need to understand the historical geography of the Old Testament. We need to understand the social structures that exist in the Old Testament. We need to understand the people and the religions of the Old Testament. We need to understand the land, the taxation system, and the tributary system that we find in the Old Testament. Obviously, we can't deal with all these areas in the time that we have, but it gives us an outline for personal study. If you want to pursue this study, you'll need a concordance in the Bible dictionary to assist you in this study. Amen. In our previous study, we looked at the geography of the ancient Near East. And we said that that roughly translates to our modern Middle East. We said it are two major fatal areas, Mesopotamia on one side and the now Delta on the other side. The ancient Near East was surrounded by various mountain ranges, Caucasus Mountains, the Zagros Mountains, the Taurus Mountains, to name a few. It had, two, it had major waterways. You had the Caspian Sea, you have the Black Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea, the rivers Tigris, Euphrates, and the Nile. Nile. All these are part of what, is, what exists in the ancient Near East. It had some major desert areas, the Sahara, the Sinai Desert, and the Arabian Desert. And located at the crossroads of this ancient Near East was the Promised Land. And last week we looked at the ancient Near East and its geography and its history. In this session, we look at the Promised Land. We need to try and understand the Promised Land, understand its history, understand its geography, of this area known as the Promised Land. Why is it important for us to study this history and geography? Well, I've called it historical geography. Why? You see, many books exist that discuss the history of the Bible lands. There are many other books that exist that concentrate on the geography of the Bible lands. In this course, we are going to combine the two and we'll deal with um, historical geography. What exactly is historical geography? Historical geography is the gathering together of both the history and the geography of the Bible lands into one. The idea is that we want to be able to try and look at each historical event mentioned in the scriptures and seek to place it in its proper geographical location to allow believers and authors of the word to have that pictorial view of the scripture and where the events of the scripture actually took place. That's the whole idea. Let's dive in. In the book of Luke, chapter 10, you read a story. Jesus told this story. And chapter 10, verse 30, the Bible says, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's all we are told in verse 30 of chapter 10. Now, you all know that story. It's a story of the Good Samaritan. It's a very popular story, very well-known story. 
Children in Sunday school know about it. Bible studies it's covered. It's a popular theme of many sermons from the pulpit. And we generally understand the moral connected to the story. We appreciate the importance of helping people in need. Those that Jesus referred to as my neighbor. We take this story, draw out some spiritual lessons and spiritual principles from the story that the Lord Jesus Christ himself told. If you go to the internet on www.biblestudytools.com and look for the story of the Good Samaritan, this is what the authors have said. The Bible story of the Good Samaritan is a parable to demonstrate how we should love our neighbors as ourselves. When others need our help the most, like the man beaten by robbers on the road, our love for neighbors is truly tested. Jesus instructs us to be like the Good Samaritan, helping others in times of suffering, and not like the priest and the Levite who neglected their neighbor. So according to the authors of this article, the moral of the story is that we should be willing to love, show love and help others in times of suffering. And we should not be like the priest and the Levite who neglected their neighbor. As I was going through this, with other views, I came across another article on www.biblicalarchaeology.org. The author of this story, Dr. Levin, says the parable offers a vision of life rather than death. It evoked 2 Chronicles 28, which recounts how the prophet Obed convinced the Samaritans to aid their Judean captives. It insists that enemies can prove to be neighbors, that compassion has no boundaries, and that judging people on the basis of their religion or their ethnicity will leave us all dying in a ditch. Then Dr. Levin then insists that to grasp the full import of the story, one must understand the times and the concerns of first century Judea where Jesus and his followers lived. I like that last part. It's such a crucial point. Dr. Levin insists that it's crucial to understand the times and the concerns of the first century Judea, where Jesus and his followers lived, if we are going to have a proper understanding of the story of the good Samaritan. I agree. However, it's not just this story that, we, that we'll be able to understand. We'll also be able to understand other stories told in the Bible if we can just be able to understand the times and the concerns in which the stories were told and understand them in that era, from that background, from that basis, it will give us a much better understanding. I would actually say we need to understand their world so that we can be able to con completely and correctly interpret their stories. If we don't understand their world, we can't understand their stories because their stories are told in a world. On your screen you have a picture that I've put there. It's a, it's a picture of the land of Israel Somewhere in the land of Israel, it's a picture. Now, just have a look at that picture on your screen. Take it in. View those um, mountainous areas around. All those sedimentary rocks that are there. And let's go back. Have this picture in your mind as we go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. 
Chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, literally, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is going down. It goes down. It's a descent. You need to understand, Jerusalem is built on a mountainous area, Mount Zion, up in the mountains. And Jericho, on the other hand, is located in a valley, the Jordan Valley. So if you look at that picture that you have in front of you on the screen, it shows you how the road was, how it meandered from up there in Jerusalem, going through, meandering through the mountains, all the way, going down to the valley where Jericho was located. It passed through the wilderness, through valleys, surrounded by hills, and these hills and mountains and valleys, this road, actually there were many caves on this road. And in those caves, that's where all the robbers were hiding. So this dangerous and treacherous landscape is simply referred to in Scripture as going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Just going down. Now, once you have a proper picture, as you look at this road, you have a proper picture of how the road was going down from the mountain area where Jerusalem was, down to Jericho in the valley, going through the, cave, the, 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 the mountainous areas, the hillsides, and all these caves located around there, you begin to understand why a man could be beaten up, robbed, stripped naked, and left for dead. You also begin to understand why the two travelers who came avoided stopping to help him, even though they could see that the man needed help. You also can begin to see that the man who stopped to help this man was taking a huge risk with his life and his property. So when you understand the kind of the scenario, you understand the kind of the landscape, you understand how the geography of the area was and how the road went down from Jerusalem up in the mountains to down to Jericho in the valleys, through the mountains, their cave, and, and there are a lot of caves, you begin to under, have a picture of what type of trip and what type of travel it was. And when you begin to see this landscape, you begin to get a much better picture of the type of road that the man traveled on. And, that, and how he could actually easily be robbed by the ones who were in the caves, the robbers. So we understand how the man could be robbed because of the nature of the road. Now what about the other two men who simply passed by and did not stop? Those two religious men, the priest and the Levite, who chose not to help the man in need. How do we normally understand them? I'll tell you. We normally think these guys are religious hypocrites who saw a man in need and decided not to help. But is that really a fair way to understand it or to label them? You need to get back to the beginning, to the whole social life and the social life that concerned the priests and the Levites and the people of Israel in those days to be able to have another look, another understanding of the story. In the book of Numbers, God spoke to Moses. He gave Moses a clear scripture in the book of Numbers. Chapter 19 and verse 11. 
God says to Moses, whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. That meant any one of the children of God who touched a dead person was unclean for seven days. If you go to Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord gave Moses these instructions for Aaron's sons, the priests. Touching a dead body will make you unclean. So don't go near. So the priests were given specific instructions. Touching a dead body will make you unclean, so don't even go near. So we understand this kind of a background that affected the priests. And you imagine those people who met the man by the road who was stripped naked and beaten up. What might have been going through their mind? If we go down and touch the man and is dead and will be unclean for seven days, for the whole week, other purity laws, you do something, by end of the day, it's, it's ended, you wash up, you clean up, you're ready for the next day. Even eating the food that was brought to the temple, you can be unclean for the day, by evening, you are clean. You can partake later on or the next day. But with touching a dead body, you were unclean for a complete week. So once you understand these purity laws that govern the priests and the Levites and the children of Israel, you may begin to have a different understanding of why those two men never stopped. Maybe. Let's just assume. Maybe they were the ones who were officiating at the temple. Maybe they were on duty. So if they touched the man and he was dead, they would have been unclean for a whole week, and that would have affected their performance, their, their, their duty to officiate at the temple, and that would have affected the work of God at the temple. So look at this scripture. The man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you understand the kind of terrain. And you understand the kind of social structure that existed for the people of God in that day. You begin to have a better understanding of how to understand this particular scripture. It gives you an understanding and stretches the importance of what a simple study, simple knowledge of the geography of the area and the simple knowledge of the social setting of the people really enriches your understanding of the word of God. And it's crucial for us to be able to have that understanding. Now, reading the Old Testament, there are many scriptures in the Old Testament that can only be properly understood when we take time to understand the land in which these events took place. For instance, you come across a scripture in the book of Isaiah 9 that speaks of the way of the sea. What was the way of the sea? Where was that? In the Old Testament, you read about the perpetual enemies of Israel, the Philistines, the Philistines and their five cities. Where were these cities of the Philistines located in Israel? In many places in the Old Testament, you read. Scripture makes reference to a place known as the Sea of Kinnereth. Like, for example, in Joshua 12, verse 3. Or a place called Jeshimon. In 1 Samuel 26, verse 1. Where are these places? What are these places? And where are they? Where were they located in the promised land? When you go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 7, Moses lists all the areas 
that the chosen people were to conquer and to occupy in the land. That list includes what Moses called the hill country, the arid country, the Shepela, the Negev, the coastal plain. Where are these places? Where in the land of Israel are these places located? So we see such scriptures in the Bible. Unless you have an understanding of where these places are, it limits your understanding of the word of God. Now on your screen is a map, the region's map of the land of Israel. It's all colored up nicely in uh, different colors to make it easier to understand. And if you look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 7, we just read that scripture together. It says, turn and resume your journey. Verse 6, they said, you have been on this mountain too long. And in verse 7 it says, turn and resume your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah. Hmm? In the hill country. And in the Shepela. In the Negev. And on the coast. The land of the Canaanites and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So if you look at your map that you have there, these areas that Moses said the people of Israel were going to be able to occupy are basically, you can take those and just break up the whole land of Israel into six pieces to have, to, to have a better understanding of these areas. The first one that you see in the scripture, it says the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. That's the coastal plain. On your map, that's that green little lime green kind of space on your map, the coastal plain. The second line, second place that is mentioned in that scripture, it says, and in the lowland, the Shepela. The Shepela or the lowlands, that's number two on your, on your screen there. The second one, labeled the Shepela with that olive kind of... Um, Color, it's labeled Shepela. The third one you see in the scripture, it says, in the hill country. The hill country, that's that yellow part of the land that you see on your map. The fourth one, it says, the Araba or the Rift Valley. That's the one that you see there in that purple color on your map. The fifth one, we are told, is a place known as the Negev, or the South Country. That's the one that you have on your map there, labeled Negev in orange. And the last part is the Transjordan. That's your olive kind of color on the end there, labeled Transjordan. So literally, the whole country can be broken up into these six small pieces to be able to understand the promised land. They were told they are going to occupy the coastal plain. Now the coastal plain stretches from Lebanon up there in the border, Lebanon border up in the north, right down to where Gaza is in the south. The only thing that breaks up this lime green color on your map is a range of mountains known as Mount Carmel. The second one that goes there, the Shepela, were basically low hills that are between the plain and the hill country. The hill country was a piece of land just to the other side of the Dead Sea. And Dead Sea, which was half desert, half cultivable land. Some of the places are desert, some of the places could, one could be able to cultivate them. Then you have the Jordan Valley, which is just basically part of that whole great rift valley of the earth that continues from the Red Sea up there down into Africa. 
the Negev is that area of arid terrain, very arid, wilderness, towards the end, just near the Sinai Peninsula, and you have the Transjordan, which is on the um, right-hand side, and that place was famous for its cattle. Amos talks about the fat cows of Bashan in the book of Amos. That's the area where you find the expression of that scripture. So in all, the whole land of the promised land extends from up there in the north near the, one of the sources of the Jordan River near Lebanon at a place called Dan and comes right down to Beersheba in the Negev. Now, within this small area, there's a great variety of topography, there's a great variety of climate. Now, if you look at the map that's on your screen there, on one side it says Mediterranean Sea, then you have the physical map on the other side. We've already said that these are the areas that were there. The first area is your coastal plain. This coastal plain, there are many key sections of the coastal plain. There are a lot of plains on that coastal plain. You have the plain of Asher, the plain of Dor, the plain of Sharon, and the plain of Philistia. Now, first of a better understanding of this background, let's just look at two of these plains. Let's examine the plain of Sharon and the plain of Philistia, two of them out of all the plains you find on the coastal plain. Now, on, in the plain of Sharon, there are many biblical events that took place in that plain of Sharon. If you look at your map, you see the plain of Sharon up there towards Mount Carmel. A lot of biblical events took place in that area. So it's important for us to be able to, if we're going to understand the scriptures, we need to understand where these events actually took place. For instance, on the plain of Sharon, you have the port of Joppa. Ah, I can see people are beginning to say, Joppa, yes. The story of Jonah, very true. Story of Jonah. Jonah the prophet was called by God to go and um, preach to the people of Nineveh and decides to run away. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 1, he went to Joppa, got on a ship, and that was bound for Tarshish. So Jonah left Joppa for Tarshish. So Joppa there on the coastal plain is the area where Jonah got his transport from the area running away from God. Another important event that happened at Joppa. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 15, we see Solomon building the temple. Solomon was building a temple for God. And in 2 Chronicles 2, 15, 2 16, rather, we are told that the timber for the first temple of Solomon and even the timber for the second temple that was built after Israel came from captivity in Babylon, the timber was brought by sea up to the port of Joppa. And from there they were able to take it into the land to be able to build the temple. Both the first temple and the second temple. The first temple story is found in 2 Chronicles 2 particularly verse 16, and the second temple is found in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 7. First temple was destroyed in 586 by King Nebuchadnezzar, and the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Dedicated in 515 BC when they came back from captivity and destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Another interesting story that happened at Joppa, the story of Peter and Cornelius. 
in Acts chapter 9, verse 9, chapter 9 and chapter 10. You all know the story. Peter is hungry. While he's waiting for lunch, he decides to go up onto the roof and rest a bit. While he's there, he sees the vision. Vision of this long sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of foodstuffs. And God says, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, no way. I've never eaten anything that was unclean. And God reminds him, never call what God has cleansed unclean. And that happened for a while, and Peter kept on wondering, what does this mean? Until the people were sent from Cornelius came to look for him at the home of Simon, the tanner, at Joppa. So you see where it happened. It's just right there on the coast, right there on the plain, at the coast city of Joppa. That's where Peter went. And that's where this thing happened. And he had to travel with them to Caesarea. Second town we find on that place is Caesarea. Caesarea is a port city that was built by King Herod. So he was not just a bad guy, he also did some good stuff. He built the port city of Caesarea. But apart from that, the other key events of the Bible that happened at Caesarea. Do you remember Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the deacons that were ordained in the book of Acts? We are told he was from the city of Caesarea. And they had four daughters that prophesied. So Caesarea was the home of Philip the Evangelist. The Apostle Paul had a great history with the city of Caesarea. After he had come to Christ and preached in Damascus, they wanted to kill him. You know the story. The disciples had to lower him. Um, down the wall of the city in a basket. And that's how he left and found himself mingled with the disciples later on and then he went off. They wanted to kill him. Then they had to um, help him escape from the city up to Caesarea on his way to Tarsus. That story is found in the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 30. Being a port city, whenever Paul went for missions trip, and when he came back, he landed at the port city of Caesarea. Acts 18, Acts 22, that's where he landed. The trials of Paul took place in the city of Caesarea. Acts 23, we are told the plans to kill Paul, the plot was overheard by Paul's sister's son, told the centurion, the centurion had to escort Paul to Caesarea with an armed escort. He gave an armed escort to take Paul to Caesarea, to the governor. That's Acts 23. Acts 24. Paul appeared before Governor Felix at Caesarea. Acts 24, verse 27. Paul spent two years in prison at Caesarea. Acts 25. Paul appeared before Festus and King Agrippa at Caesarea. So Caesarea is a city of huge biblical importance. But Caesarea was also the city where the Jewish revolt of AD 66 began. That we'll cover in details when we look at the intermediate period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But it all started at Caesarea and it led to the destruction of the city and the temple in AD 70 by the Romans. The second plain we are going to look at in those coastal plains is the plain of the Philistines. What do we know about the Philistines? According to Amos chapter 9, verse 7, Amos says the Philistines came from a place known as Kafto. Now Kafto, if you go back and study their names, Kafto is actually what we, is, is also known as Crete. Crete was a place on the Greece, on, in Greece, on the Greeks, near the Greeks there, the Greek islands there. That's where Kafto is. So the Philistines were not indigenous to the land. They came from Greece and they settled in the land. And in that 
um, coastal area, there's a plain, there's a plain known as the plain of the Philist of Philistia, of the Philistines plain. That's the area that they occupied. And in that area, there are five main cities that are mentioned in the Bible in Joshua 13 and many other places in the Bible which are known as the cities of the lords of the Philistines are located right there along that coastal plain. The cities of Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and the city of Gath. The five cities of the lords of the Philistines are located along that coastal plain. The plain of Philistia or the plain of the Philistines. Now if you read the scripture, you'll know that Gath is a famous place. It was a city of a very famous person, Goliath the champion of the Philistines. He hails from Gath. You read about him and his history with Gath in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 4. And that's where his story is. And in the book of Judges, from Judges 15 to Judges 16, Samson has a great history with those cities of the Philistines. After a party, the Philistines that came threatened his wife and he had to tell her the story of where they, the reader he told, that he told them. That meant that he had to pay them the 30 changes of garments. He went into the Philistine area killed 30 people, got their garments, and brought them to these people and paid them. One of the wars, after he was captured in Judges 15, we are told the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and with the jawbone of a donkey, he was able to kill a thousand Philistines. Later on, he revealed the secret of his strength to Delilah, and his eyes were put out. Then they had a party in their temple, and they brought him out to come and entertain them. And in Judges 16, he says, he put his hands on the pillars of the temple and of the place where they were meeting. And he pushed, and the whole thing came tumbling down. And 3,000, over 3,000 people were killed in that area together with Samson. That's in Judges 16. What else do we find in the plains of the Philistines? Something known as the way of the sea. The way of the sea was an international route that moved from Egypt to Damascus and beyond at a place called Megiddo. Megiddo, Amageddon, Har Megiddo, Megiddo, it turns inland on its way to Damascus. So that's the plain of the Philistines. The second thing we, ha we have after the plains of the Philistines, the, plain, the coastal plain, is the Shepela. The Shepela is located east of the coastal plain. It extends from the valley of Aijalon up there towards Gaza. Now this Shepela, the lowland, was a buffer zone between the Israelites on the coast I mean the Israelites on the highland and the Philistines on the coast. So there are a lot of what are known as fortified cities in that area, in the lowlands. Some important ones that we find in there is like a place called Adullam, mentioned in 1 Samuel 22 verse 1. Now Adullam is where you find the cave where David hid when he was running away from Saul. And that key town you find in the Shepherd there is a place known as Keilah. Keilah is where David fights the Philistines. That story is told to us in 1 Samuel 23. Now, the, the, that, that Shepherd, the lowlands, was famous for a number of battles between Samson, the Philistines, Judah, and the Philistines. In 1 Chronicles 26, rather, 2 Chronicles 26, we are told King Uzziah kept his sheep, his livestock, in the lowlands, in the Shepela. 
Now, what else do we know about this area called the Shepela, the lowlands? There are some important valleys that we find in the Shepela. You have the valley of Sorek and the valley of Elah. The number of valleys, but these two are of huge importance to us. The valley of Sorek is where Delilah hails from. Judges 16 tells us it was the, air, the land, the place where Delilah came from. At the same time, the valley of Shor Sorek is the place where Samson got his wife, at a place called Timnah. In the valley of Elah, in the lowlands, that's where David defeated Goliath. And that story is told to us in 1 Samuel 17. Now, there are two biblical towns of importance that I'll discuss with you that are located in the Shepherd. The map that's before you, you find a lot of towns that are mentioned there. Kayla that we talked about, Adulam, we talked about it just now, read to David. The, where the caves are, where he fought the Philistines, the, all these important towns. But I want to just center in on two of them only that are of quite significance to us. The city mentioned there called Beth Shemesh and the city known as Kiriath Jearim. Why are these two towns of importance to us? In 1 Samuel chapter 4, we are told. Israel was in battle with the Philistines. And they were being beaten. So someone decides, let's bring the ark of the Lord. And the ark at that time was at a place known as Shiloh. So they sent for the ark at Shiloh. When the ark came, there was so much celebration. The Philistines said, what could that be? Then someone says, the ark of the Lord has come to them. And the Philistine says, we are dead. God has come to be with them. But Philistines fight like a man. Go down like a man. And the Philistines fought. Israel lost the battle. And Israel lost the ark. And the ark was taken by the Philistines and put in their temple, the temple of their god Dagon. And so many nasty things happened to Dagon. Because they put him next to the, temp, to the ark of the, the Lord, as if they are equal. The next morning when they come to check, Dagon was in his, was on his face in front of the ark of the Lord. They cleaned him up, put him back. The next day they came, they found Dagon in pieces before the ark of the Lord. They realized, we've got to send this thing back, otherwise we're dead. So when they were taking the ark back to Israel, to the people of God, to the children of God. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 6, verse 12, it was taken only across the border into the town of Beth Shemesh. And Beth Shemesh later on, the, the, the people of God took the ark from there and took it to Kiriath Jearim. Now, a lot of things happened when the ark was lost to Israel. We read in 1 Samuel 15, 5 and verse 18 that Eli the priest was sitting by the temple when he got news that the ark of the Lord had been lost to the Philistines. The Bible says he fell back, broke his neck, and he died. So that news devastated Eli. Where still his sons Phineas and Hophni were also killed in the battle. The daughter-in-law was expecting when she got the news that the ark of the Lord had been lost in the battle to the Philistines, that her husband had also died in the battle, Phineas' wife gave, went into labor and gave birth. As she was dying, the midwives told her, be of good cheer, you are encouraged, You've got a son. And she called the son Ichabod. And Ichabod means the glory has departed. So she said with the loss of the ark from Israel, the glory has departed from the land. Beth Shemesh is also set apart as a Levitical city. What's a Levitical city? 
I want you to go and study on your own, but basically, Levitical city is the city that was given to the sons of Levi. There are 48 of them in the in, in total. You can find that account in Numbers 35. This city was later recaptured by the Philistines early in the reigns of King Ahaz in 2 Chronicles 28. So when the ark was removed from Beth Shemesh, it went to Kiriath Jearim in the house of Aminadab. In that house, the ark stayed for 20 years while David was building a new place where the ark was going to be placed. And the Bible says, because the ark was in the presence of this house, in Kiriath Jerahim, the people were blessed who, who stayed in that, uh, that house. The owner of the house was blessed. And that's what happens. If you have the presence of God in your life, you get a blessing. So what are we saying this morning? If we are going to understand the Old Testament in detail, we need to have an understanding not only of the ancient Near East, we must also understand the promised land which the Bible talks about, which makes a lot of reference in the old, which the Old Testament makes a lot of references. And to have this understanding, we need to understand the, how the land is broken up. You have the coastal plain where the Philistines were residing within their five main cities. We talked about those. And you have the plains of Sharon, where you have the city of Caesarea and the port city of Joppa, where a number of biblical events took place. Second, next to the coastal plain, you have the Shepela, the lowlands. That's where a lot of events also took place in that particular area. Thank you for attending this class. We'll, he we'll end here for now. And we'll continue on again in the next class. If you have any questions, any comments, you want any clarification, post your comments in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook. Please take some time to support this channel. Click the like button and subscribe. Lord bless you and see you in the next class. God bless you.